I want to thank the organizers, but in particular, I want to thank the audience for staying for the last lecture. It's a privilege to speak to you today. Uh, I have the opportunity as the last speaker to try and put together a lot of information uh, that other presenters have uh, put forward to you. Uh, and one of the observations that I would make is we've talked a lot about pathways in the last four days. Uh, mainly genomic pathways, but also practice pathways. Uh, and there are times in my life as an investigator over the last 35 years when the pathways have been clear and other times when the pathways have been indistinct. And what I would say about uh, the convergence of genomic and treatment pathways right now is that they do not converge in a very satisfying way. And I'm going to try and talk to you about that uh, through my talk. So what are we trying to do with adjuvant therapy? Uh, obviously, what we're trying to do is convert people who have been surgically resected from uh, being uh, subject to metastatic colon cancer into being cured. Uh, and one of the things that we would dearly like to do is not treat 100% of patients, but only treat the patients that uh, would uh, benefit from our therapy. And perhaps uh, what uh, Dr. Diaz talked to us about, uh, looking at uh, DNA assays will help us make judgments in the future about who should be treated and who shouldn't. We want to individualize our therapy. That is to treat the patient with the right drug to eradicate their cancer. Uh, and to minimize the toxicity, particularly the long-term toxicity that they have. We also want to treat them with just enough drug to eradicate that last cancer cell so that they don't have to put up with the toxicity uh, and the drawbacks of being uh, treated for a moment longer than they need to. But it's very difficult for us to understand who needs more and who needs less. I think it's simplistic for us to assume that every patient should be treated with six months of treatment or every patient should be treated with three months of treatment uh, because it's unlikely that one size fits all. We need to discover new treatments and of course we need to be cognizant of the costs, uh, both uh, financial costs and, and other costs. Now, we're not talking about a small number of patients. Uh, there are about 150,000 deaths across the world every year from stages one through three colon cancer. So the meaning of this is profound to those individuals and their families that have the disease. Len Gunderson is one of my mentors and uh, he did this work that showed uh, something important to us. That is that stage is not a perfect predictor of outcome and that individuals with T4 tumors actually have a worse prognosis than some individuals with uh, uh, node positive tumors, even if those T4 tumors are node negative. And so our subdivision of patients into stage two doesn't need treatment, stage three does, uh, is probably also overly simplistic uh, and a bears refinement. Part of the issue that we have to deal with is uh, well illustrated by this cartoon, which is one of my favorites. This shows the potential uh, for clonal evolution uh, occurring across time. Uh, and you see the red box, which is an early time in the diagnosis of the tumor, perhaps corresponding to the time that uh, surgery occurs, when there's a number of clones, but a limited number of clones. And we've seen that what we do by treating these clones with uh, drugs is to provoke their evolution and make them harder to eradicate. Uh, but even at the time that we're considering adjuvant therapy, uh, it's likely that the tumor has diversity and isn't uh, all the same. So how do we decide to treat only those who will benefit? Well, in stage two disease, we're treating 100 people to help two or three. In stage three disease, we're treating 100 people to perhaps help 20. Uh, that's not very satisfying. And this is a slide that I borrowed from John Marshall that shows in stage two disease uh, that the vast majority of people are either over-treated or under-treated and nobody's treated with just the right amount of treatment except for about that 
So we've strived to put order uh, on what is a disorderly biologic process. And some of the uh, techniques that we've used is to try and develop staging systems, to develop numeracy calculators, to look at the gene panels that the last speaker just talked about, uh, to do genomic analyses, uh, to look at circulating tumor cells and guanocyclase, uh, some of which have been uh, important to us and some that have faded in importance over time. This is an example of a, a nomogram developed by the Accent Group with uh, thousands and thousands of patients uh, whose uh, individual treatment records are part of this database. And the point of this was to try and create an internally valid nomogram that we could plug our patient's characteristics into and the patient sitting in front of us uh, and help them and help ourselves understand who should be treated. Here are the factors that are considered. Uh, things like gender, women have a better prognosis than men. Uh, race, African Americans in the US have a worse prognosis than Caucasians. And then the classical tumor things that we use as part of our staging procedures. And here you see these very nice curves that show that the nomogram may be a little better than staging. But in the end, this isn't very satisfying to me in the clinic or to the patient that I'm presenting it to because it doesn't really say exactly what applies to that individual. We talked uh, just in the last lecture about uh, some of the uh, genomic profiles that have been done. Uh, I picked the genomic health profile to discuss just because it's uh, clinically available in the United States and perhaps has been subject to the most validation. Uh, you know that it's a relatively small sample of genes, uh, only 12 genes, and only seven of those genes are actually related to colon cancer. Uh, and that in colon cancer, unlike in breast cancer, it is prognostic but not predictive. And so this is the original study. It was a well-conducted study. It was large. It used samples from the Cleveland Clinic Foundation and the NSABP. Uh, there was a discovery set and a validation set. It then was validated in uh, other studies, as was illustrated uh, a few moments ago. Uh, and in the end, it gives you these curves. Uh, and I don't know about you and your practice, but I have maybe ordered this test about five times in my entire uh, career. Uh, in the end, it, it isn't enough to really help me make the decisions that I need to make. Now, this uh, also was just presented a moment ago that uh, the, the recurrence score can be helpful in determining likely sensitivity to oxaliplatin. Uh, and uh, again, I don't think that this is commonly used, even though uh, on one end of the spectrum, there's about a 3% likelihood of benefit from oxali and the other about a 9% benefit. So that's what's happened when we looked at tumors uh, whose outcomes uh, are clear to us because they've been involved in clinical trials or in databases. Uh, the the uh, Human uh, G Cancer Genome Atlas Network study is a very important study, but one that is compromised by the lack of clinical uh, information on the patients whose tumors were analyzed. 276 tumors, uh, far-reaching uh, genomic analysis, including microRNA, uh, perhaps important in that it helped us understand that about 16% of tumors were hypermutated, that colon and rectal cancers are genetically uh, similar, uh, and identified a number of genes that we expected to see as mutated and some that perhaps were less uh, expected and identified some potential new targets. And you've all seen this. It illustrates the Wnt pathway, TGF-beta, uh, P53, uh, PI3 kinase uh, as important uh, pathways in colorectal cancer. Uh, and uh, has changed our thinking in terms of the hypermutated versus non-hypermutated uh, and the potential to subdivide approaches to patients based on predominant pathways uh, in each individual tumor. Now, in the United States, the NSABP and Alliance are combining the data sets from N0147 and CO8 to choose 1,400 patients with known outcomes and to do genomic sequencing on these in order to develop profiles that discriminate between patients and 
who do and who do not recur. Uh, and I'm hopeful that this will provide some of the utility that uh, I feel that we lack with current pathways. Now, I put this up there. Uh, this is a study by Frank Sinekrope, who spoke to us earlier. Uh, and it's one of many that shows how we've tried to impose order on, on the genomic abnormalities that have been discovered. But the main reason for using this is it shows that there are small subsets of uh, tumors, 7% uh, in the serrated pathway uh, who are either uh, proficient or deficient in uh, mismatch repair, 3% in the familial deficient mismatch repair. Uh, and so when you think about designing the next big uh, colon adjuvant study, uh, do you assume that all these turn out the same, or do we start subdividing these and trying to target the targets that are present in the individual patients rather than just use cytotoxics to target DNA replication? And here you can see the prognostic value of this. Again, interesting, but hard to know how to apply in the clinic. So I would say that today, I still can't tell who to treat and who not to treat as a patient with stage three disease sits in front of me. Now what about individualizing the treatment? Well, this is a, a black and white picture. Of some in the audience have probably never seen a black and white picture. Uh, this was Chuck Mortel who invented uh, uh, adjuvant therapy for colorectal cancer with 5-FU and levamisole. Levamisole, a long forgotten drug in colorectal cancer. Uh, and 5-FU in this meta-analysis uh, done by Charlene Gill uh, shows some overall survival benefit, about 7% overall. And then there's oxaliplatin. Uh, and again, about 5% of people are converted from relapsers to, to people who are cured uh, by the addition of oxaliplatin. But in order to do that, we give oxaliplatin to everybody with stage three disease. And here you see the modest benefit, about a 4% difference in overall survival, uh, something that bears up well in both N1 and N2 patients. But the worse the stage, the larger the benefit. The more advanced the disease, the poorer prognosis, uh, the more the benefit, and as is conveyed by the orange bars for oxaliplatin. And so the people with the most to lose, the T4BN2s, uh, get more than a doubling of survival likelihood uh, with full FOX, but the T1 uh, to 2 N1As get only a, a minimal benefit uh, from the addition of oxaliplatin. But they also remember their oxaliplatin for a long time after they finish it uh, with uh, even grade three neuropathy affecting people two, three, and four years after their treatment is complete. But in the end, I don't want to be pessimistic about this. We've achieved a lot. Uh, in the old days, without adjuvant therapy, 60% of people uh, survived stage three colon cancer. And now we're up to 78% of people surviving uh, stage three colon cancer. <clears throat> The other thing that's of interest is the international collaboration that has come under the umbrella of the IDEA uh, uh, consortium. Uh, and this is a study that's looking at six months versus three months of full FOX uh, in stage three patients uh, by combining trials from across the world. Uh, and the study is almost completed. Uh, it's accrual. Uh, here you can see the studies. There are two in the red bars that are still accruing, but they're nearly done with their accrual. Uh, the study's been subject to interim analysis and has not been closed down, suggesting that uh, there isn't a terrible disadvantage for three months of therapy. But again, I ask you, are you confident that those T4B N2 patients only need three months of oxaliplatin no matter what this shows? Uh, and I'm not as confident that that'll be the, the case. Now, we also have enrolled many, many patients on ineffective adjuvant therapies, uh, much to our dismay. Uh, and at least if you look across the entire population enrolled in these studies, arenotecan, bevacizumab, and cetuximab have offered no clinically significant improvement in value. And these have been corroborated in at least two trials. So why have biologic agents not succeeded? Well, in treating advanced disease, 
while we would like to eradicate every last cancer cell, we still gain benefit if we slow them down, if we kill some of them, if we apply selective evolutionary pressure on them uh, that uh, prolongs patient survival. But in the adjuvant setting, what we need to cure people is to eliminate that last metastatic cell. Uh, and you could argue that targeted agents, because they're mainly cytostatic and not cytotoxic, are not the way to do that. Uh, I think that's probably an oversimplification, uh, but it perhaps is a partial explanation. So here's the NSABP CO8, uh, Folfox plus or minus bevacizumab. You remember this study was almost closed early because in the first year, uh, it, the hazard ratio was 0.6, but as time matured, it became clear that we weren't eradicating uh, resistant clones with this. We were suppressing them, and in the end, there was no difference. The same thing was true of the uh, uh, NO147 study with full FOX plus or minus cetuximab, where cetuximab actually tracks non-significantly worse than full FOX alone. So the next thing we want to do is to try and discover new treatments. And here's a subset analysis looking at the NSABP CO8 data uh, for just the MMR proficient and MMR deficient patients. And it suggests that in the MMR deficient patients, the MSI high patients, that perhaps bevacizumab created uh, an advantage uh, for those patients even a statistically significant advantage. Uh, this is about 250 patients uh, that fit into this subset. Uh, in addition, uh, there was a look at the NO147. I'm sorry, this is the, uh, the CLGB study uh, 89803 with IFL versus 5 of Fulicavorin, suggesting that a subgroup of patients benefited from the uh, renotecan. And then there's this data that led to the current U.S. intergroup study uh, that is experimenting with celecoxib versus placebo as one of the two arms, uh, two of the forearms in the study. Uh, and you've seen this data from the Women's Health Study that suggests that aspirin use suppresses tumors that are PI3 kinase uh, mut mutated uh, and reduces uh, both the recurrence risk and the development risk. And then you've heard this study discussed uh, today as well. Uh, this was a study that uh, we participated in at Ohio State, uh, run by Johns Hopkins, looking at PD-1 blockade with the agent pebrolizumab uh, in patients. Uh, and there were three groups of patients. Uh, colon cancer patients with MMR deficiency, colon cancer patients who were not MMR deficient, uh, and non-colorectal cancer patients whose tumors were MSI high. And I have to tell you that I have never seen responses in my patients like the responses I've seen in these uh, Lynch syndrome and uh, hypermutated patients that I've treated in this uh, series. And this is startling data for, uh, albeit a small study, of a disease control rate of 92% uh, in MMR deficient colorectal cancer. And uh, Lewis showed this uh, series of slides about not only is there disease control that is rapid, but it's also long lasting. So is that something we could apply to the adjuvant setting? Well, the melanoma doctors are ahead of us in terms of their experience with PD-1 inhibitors. Uh, and this is a study published in melanoma in Lancet Oncology. Adjuvant uh, ipilimumab versus placebo uh, showing a three-year recurrence-free survival difference of 13% in a much higher risk uh, for recurrence cancer uh, population. So in summary, uh, we are trying to cure all patients with the residual micrometastases, uh, but it's unclear how to make the next marginal step forward. Uh, and it may be that, like the IDEA consortium, we across the world are going to have to converge and agree to uh, look at colorectal cancer as a series of diseases based on molecular profiling. Uh, and to look at the strategies for eradicating uh, the last micrometastatic lesion in those patients based on genomics, not as uh, a series where we consider all colon cancers the same. 
We desperately need ways to find out how to treat only those who will benefit. I have high hopes for circulating DNA, uh, but I bet that it's going to take some time to see if that really will pan out. We want to treat patients with the right drugs, and again, that uh, reflects on the heterogeneity, minimize the toxicity, discover new treatments, and minimize our research costs. So again, I would say if there's been a theme with respect to colorectal cancer at this meeting, it's that we need to recognize and exploit the heterogeneity of colon cancer rather than try to erase the differences that genomics is helping us to understand. We need to develop studies that are driver dependent. And even though patients with MSI high tumors who are stage two have a better prognosis, you saw data that the stage three patients who are MSI high presented at this meeting don't have a better prognosis. And the thought of trying pembrolizumab uh, as a relatively non-toxic treatment in those patients is appealing to me. And then we need to pool our resources. We need to work across the world together uh, if we're going to continue to make progress in colon cancer uh, and to consider uh, uh, all of the possibilities uh, and really discerning which patients we do and we don't need to treat is a, is a critical thing moving forward. So I thank you for your attention, uh, for staying to the end of the meeting, and we have one last uh, thing that we have to accomplish before we go out into the sunshine. Thank you very much.